Hi, everyone. We'll get started today. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Helena Mystery, and I'm the Director of Business Development at Amica. Today's webinar title is MRI Markers for the Spinal Cord, and our speaker today is Dr. Julian Cohen Adad. Today's talk will be 35 minutes, followed by 20 minutes of Q&A, so that puts the total at a little under an hour. Afterwards, uh, if you have any questions, you can click the raise hand button and I will unmute you and allow you to ask Julian a question. Alternatively, you can type your question into the question box and I'll read it out to Julian and he will answer you. I'd like to give you a little bit of background about Julian. Dr. Kona Dad is an associate professor at Polytechnic Montreal, adjunct professor in the Department of Neurosciences at, uh, at the University of Montreal, associate director at the Neuroimaging Functional Unit at the University of Montreal, and Canada Research Chair in Quantitative Magnetic Resonance Imaging. His research focuses on advancing hardware and software MRI methods to help characterize pathologies in the central nervous system with a particular focus on the spinal cord. He has published over 130 articles on that topic. Dr. Cohen Adad also dedicates efforts in bringing the community together by developing open source solutions and by organizing yearly workshops via the spinal cord MRI, or D, spinal cord MRI .org platform, which he initiated. I'll let you get started, Julian. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and also for inviting me to speak at this seminar. So let me just Okay, do you see my screen? Okay, I assume you do. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, magnetic resonance imaging biomarkers for the spinal cord. Um, and I, I'd like to start with this, uh, with this clinical case um, of a 30-year-old patient who uh, suffered from pain and a doctor decided to inject uh, corticosteroid in the epidural space, but the needle was unfortunately inserted um, in the spinal cord, causing the patient motor and sensory deficits. Um, and we can see- Julian, uh, we, yeah. we, we don't see your screen. Is it possible okay. to show your slides? My apologies. Problem is that when I- when I'm presenting, I'm losing my cursor, so it makes things a bit difficult. Okay, do you see my screen now? Yes. Yes, okay, good. Just need to see your slides, see your you desktop. See the there we go, perfect. Okay, perfect, sorry about that. So, um, yes, so this is, uh, so you now see the slide of the patient who, um, has suffered from sensory and motor deficit uh, due to this um, needle injury. And we can see on the local T2 image a hyper signal on the, at, the, at the level um, C, C6. Uh, however, there is no visible abnormality above and below the lesion, which is somewhat um, in contradiction with the clinical evaluation of the patient. And this con contradiction falls into what we call the clinical radiological paradox. So the patient was then transferred to uh, Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, where I was doing my postdoc at that time. And a neurologist, Dr. Anne-Louise Auklander, contacted me to see if we could apply advanced quantitative MRI methods to better explain those uh, clinical symptoms. So what is quantitative MRI? It's, um, it's kind of an umbrella term for um, many techniques that uh, are used with, uh, with MRI, and its main purpose is to generate maps that reflect the underlying tissue microstructure of the central nervous system or elsewhere in the body. Um, and those includes, um, you know, those markers include myelin content and axonal density. We can also probe, as many of you already know, neuronal activity using functional MRI and metabolic concentrations with MR spectroscopy. So ultimately, those QMRI markers are valuable for helping in the diagnosis and prognosis of trauma and various neurological disease. 
and they are also useful as objective biomarkers for assessing the specific efficacy of new therapeutic drugs. While qMRI has been um, widely used in the brain for more than two decades, uh, it painfully makes its way to spinal cord applications. Why is that? I'm going to talk now about a few challenges that um, that, that, that explain why uh, why qMRI is is hardly applicable to, to to the spinal cord. First challenge is related to the dimensions of the structure to image. As you can see here, the spinal cord has a very small cross-sectional size of about one centimeter diameter, and that requires to image with very high spatial resolution. Um, but as many of you know, we cannot indefinitely, um, you know, have like a sm small, um, like infinity, infinitely small voxel size or pixel size, because um, as you increase the spatial resolution, the signal to noise ratio or the sensitivity uh, of the of the signal of interest also decreases. So to overcome that problem of sensitivity or signal to noise ratio, one solution is to get better hardware. So there are two things that can help with SNR. Uh, the first thing, which is expensive, is to get better receive coils. And um, the second thing, which is even more expensive, is to get more powerful magnets. Um, and the, the 70 systems are, are, you know, slowly making their way through the um, through the you know clinical field. There's there's about 200 um, systems, 70 systems uh, in the world. Um, there are also challenges associated with those stronger magnetic fields, which I'm not going to cover uh, today, but um, these are the overall solutions for challenge number one. Challenge number two concerns susceptibility artifacts. So here I'm showing an image of diffusion tractography overlaid on an anatomical image. The seed point for the tractography was around the brainstem region. And as you can see, the tract completely stopped at around C6 vertebral level. So it's a straightforward conclusion to draw from this observation is that the subject has a complete section of the spinal cord at C6. In fact, I was the subject. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was scanned and I don't have uh, a spinal cord injury. So this interruption of track that you see here is simply caused by distortion of the image um, due to um, inhomogeneous um, B0 magnetic fields. And when we correct for those distortions, you see that the tractography um, continues without an interruption. So that's called the susceptibility artifact. And this kind of artifact is highly prevalent in the spine region because of the presence of multiple tissues with different susceptibility profiles. So there are ways to mitigate this artifact with um, smarter EPI or echoplanar imaging pulse sequences well, the overall goal is to fill up the case space faster in order to minimize the accumulation of errors in the phase encoding direction. A second approach, uh, which could be combined with the first approach, is to fix the problem at the source and compensate for B0 in homogeneities with advanced shimming methods. Challenge number three, what protocol to use? If a researcher not familiar with qMRI uh, techniques was to start a project involving spinal cord imaging, what sequence and parameters to choose? As, as I showed you before, there is a lot of um, qMRI techniques that exist, and every year at the main MRI conference called ISMRM, there are you know, new qMRI techniques that are published, uh, so it can become very overwhelming for a new researcher to, to, to pick the right um, QMRI techniques and, and in addition to that, pick also the right acquisition parameters. So in order to address that problem, we, um, we the spinal cord imaging community, which uh, regroups um, several uh, neuroimaging neuro centers in the world, uh, have been working hard for the past three years on the standardized acquisition protocol for the spinal cord QMRI data, and this is called the spine generic protocol. So 42 um, sites have been involved in this optimization and validation procedure. Importantly, the protocol is available for the three main vendors, uh, GE, Philips, and Siemens, and it is using the product sequence only. 
Um, so two companion papers describing these projects are currently under review uh, in na nature protocols and scientific data. But the protocol is already accessible uh, at this address, uh, spinalcodemri.org slash protocols. So you can already download the protocol and use it. A particularly important aspect of this protocol is that it also includes a comprehensive document with step-by-step -step procedures directed towards MR technicians in order to, to uh, acquire those images under uh, a standardized procedure. And lastly, the study, the spine generic study, comes with two publicly available data sets which were acquired using the, that protocol. So one uh, called the multi-site single subject data set uh, was acquired on a traveling subject scanned across 19 centers. And the second data set, the multi-site multi-subject, consists of 42 sites which scanned about six subjects each for a total of 260 subjects. The data set is well curated and uses the latest technologies such as the brain imaging data structure and data lab for accessing the data. As our lab is a strong advocate for transparent and reproducible science, on the website of the project, you will find a description of the analysis pipeline how to run it and how to perform quality control and manual corrections uh, on the intermediate results if necessary. So here I will guide you briefly through the analysis pipeline uh, and the biomarkers that are generated. First we take the um, T1 weighted MRI, um, the, the spinal cord is automatically segmented and then the and then uh, the vertebral labels um, are identified. Um, we have a spinal cord template called the PAM50 template, which I'm going to describe later. Uh, and the image is registered to this template, uh, so a warping field is generated. And then we can compute cross-sectional area uh, at specific vertebral levels. We do the same with the T2-weighted image, segment the cord uh, and um, register it with the PAM50 template, compute cross-sectional area. We have another image, uh, the multi-echo gradient echo image, which shows uh, good contrast between the white and the gray matter. And this one is used to uh, segment the gray matter and then compute gray matter cross-sectional area. Uh, another set of images um, with a magnetization transfer pulse on and off in order to compute the um, MTR, or magnetization transfer ratio, as well as MTSAT which is an, um, uh, another version of MTR, which is less affected by T1 effect. And lastly, we have the uh, diffusion-weighted uh, images, which are co-registered, uh, motion-corrected, um, cord is segmented, white matter, is, uh, white matter mask is created, and then metrics could be computed within these this masks, uh, metrics such as fractional anisotropy, mean diffusivity, radial diffusivity, and so on and so forth. So these are DTI uh, metrics. So let me show you now a few results of this, uh, of this study. Uh, first of all, let's look at the image quality. And here you see the sagittal T1 weighted scans from all subjects. And from that, we can already conclude that the specification for FOV or field of view placement was well respected across the uh, different sites. Here are results of spinal cord cross-sectional area or CSA, which was averaged across the C2 and C3 levels. So this is a biomarker for uh, cord atrophy, which is uh, quite popular, especially in, uh, in MS, in multiple sclerosis. Um, so what we can conclude here is that overall, the intrasite coefficient of variation was below 8%, and the within vendor intersite COV, um, so basically the, the intersite value for GE, for Philips, and for Siemens was below 4.2%. So this is a fairly good um, reproducibility within uh, vendors. 
Another relevant metric is, is magnetization transfer ratio or MTR, and this metric is sensitive to white matter demyelination, which can occur in MS. But here the intersite coefficient of variations for all vendors were below 2.5%, so even better than CSA. Values for G scanners are somewhat different from that uh, from Philips and Siemens scanner because the TR and MT pulses are different. And here are results for a DTI metric called fractional anisotropy or FA, which is sensitive to axon damage and demyelination. Again, the COVs were um, very small, below 4% for all vendors. There are more results, which I don't have the time to show here. However, these are all available online. So you can uh, go to Google, type the name of the project, uh, Spine Generic Protocol. You will end up in the uh, read the docs. Um, it's the main documentation of the project. And then you will see um, examples of good data sets for T1, T2, MT, and DWI. And if you go to the analysis pipeline, you will also uh, have access to the um, compiled results, uh, which are automatically generated from the from the latest version of the um, of the of the results, um, and you can then explore, get the values. Uh, so this is powered by Plotly, and you can here see all the different results for uh, metrics of T1 uh, CSA fractional anisotropy, mean diffusivity, uh, and so on and so forth. So let's do a quick summary of all the challenges that I uh, mentioned so far. There is challenge number one, which was about SNR and uh, better hardware. Challenge number two, which was about susceptibility artifacts. And challenge number three, which was about standardization of the acquisition protocol. Challenge number four is about data processing. So QMRI techniques require advanced image processing methods. For the past 20 years or so, several software packages have been developed to process brain multiple multiparametric MRI data. Some of these software, such as FSL, SPM, or AFNI, are very popular and provide international researchers with a common analysis platform, enabling them to reproduce and compare with the research results. So such cross-validations are essential steps for further use in clinical diagnosis or by pharmaceutical companies for drug development. While the same is true for the spinal cord, um, there has been no publicly available and widely distributed software dedicated to the spinal cord analysis of QMRI data. Moreover, brain software cannot readily be applied to spinal cord data because atlases and image features are very different. So this lack of unified processing tools motivated the development of the spinal cord toolbox or SCT which is a comprehensive and open source library of analysis tools for multiparametric MRI of the spinal cord. Let me show you an, a brief overview of SCT. It features um, specific segmentation tools for the spinal cord, a multimodal template and atlas, a framework for registration of those multiparametric data sets, and um, an atlas-based analysis framework to extract uh, relevant quantitative metrics in specific um, tracts, as well as motion corrections and many other uh, features. I will now focus on some of the important features of SCT. The first um, highlight is the PAM50 template, which is the which, which can be seen as the equivalent of the MNI template uh, for the spinal cord. And in fact, the MNI was involved in this project because the letters PAM, P-A-M, stand for Polytechnique, ex marseille Université, and MNI. And the 50 is because the template was based on 50 healthy adults. So in brief, this template includes a T1-weighted, T2-weighted, and uh, T2-star-weighted contrast. And, um, and an important aspect is that the PAM50 template shares the same coordinate system as the MNI ICBM 152 template, uh, which makes it possible to conduct brain spine studies within the same referential system. PAM50 template also includes a probabilistic atlas of white and gray matter, 
as well as an atlas of white matter tracts and gray matter parcellations. And these tract labels can be used to quantify qMRI metrics within specific spinal tracts, such as the corticospinal or the dorsal columns. Another um, useful set of tools are the segmentation methods, which are based on deep learning. There is one model for segmenting the spinal cord, which works for multiple contrasts. Um, the model was trained on a large variety of scans, multiple vendors, sequence parameters, and various pathologies. Here is an example of a successful, successful segmentation in a patient with degenerative cervical myelopathy, including um, which, which induces um, severe cord compression, which is usually difficult to segment. Another model can segment the spinal cord gray matter. Um, so here is an example of a typical in vivo scan, and the method also works for high resolution ex vivo scans. So here I'm showing an example of almost 5,000 slices which were segmented automatically with almost no need for uh, manual correction. So that was extremely useful for the researcher. We also trained a model to segment um, MS lesions in the spinal cord and another model uh, very recently published to uh, perform multi-class segmentation of tumor, cavity and edema in the spinal cord. So this model is based on data from Dr. Yao Yu at the Tiantan Hospital in Beijing and uh, I should also mention that um, some of these models are based on the latest deep learning architectures, which are implemented in a framework developed by my lab in collaboration with Mila called Ivadomed. So if you want to know more about this project, please feel free to look at ivadomed.org and there you will find uh, much more information. By default, SCT is run on the terminal. Uh, so I personally love the terminal because it enables to create batch scripts, to run pipeline, and to automatize processing. And more importantly, um, it makes the processing reproducible. However, if you hate the terminal and have prank out nightmares about it, SCT can also be run within the graphical user interface or GUI. So we have created a plugin that can be loaded from within um, FSLI software, which was developed by the FEMRIP group in Oxford. And the most important SCT functions are embedded into FSLIs, um, such as PropSeg, DeepSeg, uh, Label Vertebra, Registration to Template. And those results, therefore, can immediately be visualized and corrected if necessary. Since it its public release in 2014, SCT has been used in various applications, including structural MRI, fMRI, and in various diseases such as MS, NMO, ALS, spinal cord injury, stroke, and cancer. For an, for an exhaustive list of the references pertaining to SCT, please see the link at the bottom on the main Spinal Cord Toolbox uh, website. I will now focus on some representative examples of SCT applied to the spinal cord. The first one, um, published now five years ago, is a study by Mario Sianakas at the UCL Institute of Neurology in London. So here, SCT was used to measure cross-sectional area, or CSA, in the cervical cord in order to monitor atrophy in various phenotypes of MS patients. The fully automatic methods of SCT showed similar results than the semi-automatic method of Horsfield et al. And the advantages of a fully automatic method is that it removes user bias and makes it possible to analyze large databases in a fast and reproducible manner. The second example concerns the identification of MS plaques in the spinal cord. So there's an increasing desire from the clinical community to include more systematically the spinal cord for a more comprehensive assessment of MS pathology. So in this multi-center study, we collected spinal cord MRI data from 12 um, MS clinics and eight neuroradiologists manually segmented um, MS lesions. And these manual segmentations were subsequently used to train deep learning model, uh, which are now available in SCT. And um, 
most of the analysis uh, pipeline was uh, powered by SCT. So I'm going to briefly show you uh, what the pipeline consisted of. All the patients were registered to the PAM50 template thanks to the cord mask and lesion masks were then averaged voxel-wise and that enabled us to create um, a lesion probability map or LPM. So this lesion probability map uh, is showing the prevalence of MS lesion appearance in the cervical spinal cords and it can be used to study a potential signature of MS distribution across the various MS phenotypes. Um, clinically isolated syndrome, relapsing, remittive MS, uh, secondary progressive or primary progressive MS. Having access to the white and gray matter masks in the PAM50 template, we could also quantify the distribution of lesions in the white matter and gray matter separately across phenotypes. And we could also compute um, correlations between the expanded disability status scale or EDSS score and the lesion burden in the sensory and the motor tracts. So I mentioned earlier that the PAM50 template shared the same coordinate system as the MNI space. So we did a follow-up study where we included the brain scans from the same patients. So this follow-up study was recently published uh, in Brain. In this graph, you see the lesion frequency within the corticospinal tract all across the brain and the spine axis, uh, or the, the C-spine axis, from the juxta cortical area down to the C7 spinal cord level. We notably notice a high lesion burden in the spinal cord and corona radiata for primary progressive and secondary progressive forms of MS. And in this map, you see a comparison of lesion frequency map between SPMS, secondary progressive MS, and relapsing remittive MS. The CST, the cortical spinal tract, is indicated in the white contour in the axial views. One of the main conclusions of this study is that there is a cumulative effect of lesions within the CST along the brain, brainstem, and spinal cord portions that explain physical disability in MS patients with a predominant impact of intramedullary lesions. We are now moving to another disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. In this study, SCT was used to segment the spinal cord um, gray matter of patients at an early stage of ALS. And it was notably demonstrated that the spinal cord gray matter atrophy is a better biomarker than um, spinal cord atrophy for distinguishing patients from healthy controls. There was then a follow-up and uh, we realized that gray matter CSA uh, is also a relevant biomarker for a one-year prognosis of motor scores. In this case, ALS-FRS, which is a popular uh, score for uh, assessing ALS patients. And more specifically, prognosis is more accurate when combining clinical predictors with uh, gray matter cross-sectional area. In the context of cord compression, in the highly prevalent degenerative cervical myelopathy, being able to characterize the location and severity of the compression is very helpful for the clinician to decide on the best therapeutic approach. So we are now moving to um, an, another um, disease, um, DCM or degenerative cervical myelopathy. And SCT provides tools to analyze the shape of the spinal cord uh, based on its segmentation in the axial plane. And it can output metrics such as um, ellipticity, anteroposterior, and right-left dimensions. And these are of particular interest for studying cord compression. And um, Martin et al. at um, Toronto Western Hospital notably shown um, that these features are, are relevant, like combining uh, some of these um, shape analysis features could be relevant for a better assessment of uh, cord compression in those patients. So this uh, study concerns stroke patients. And in this study, uh, patients with unilateral stroke, um, diffusion MRI was used to assess the integrity of the brainstem and the cervical spinal cord. Track based analysis performed with SCT helped identify altered sensory motor pathways post stroke in those patients. 
These results have implications for re rehabilitation interventions postulating lateral stroke. So you can find more information in uh, this paper published in 2019 in Nature Communications. So my last example of application concerns now um, chronic pain. And here SCT was used for the first time on a combined PET MR study. So PET standardized uptake values or SUVs were extracted in the spinal cord at specific vertebral levels based on the anatomical MRI after registration with the PAN50 template. These results implicate, implicate immunoactivation at multiple levels of the nervous system as a potentially important and clinically relevant mechanism in the human radicular pain and suggest that therapies target, targeting immune cell activation may be beneficial for chronic pain patients. That study was published in pain uh, by the group of um, Macrologia uh, in, in, in the pain journal. Um, so that group is, is based at MGH in uh, Boston. So to conclude, um, presented you um, the spinal cord generic protocol. Um, and one of the main um, purpose of, of this study is really to promote replicability and dissemination of knowledge. Um, this protocol hopefully will facilitate the addition of spinal cord QMRI protocol uh, in non-expert centers. And it will also minimize variability in multi-site, multi-vendor studies. Um, this uh, protocol is already implemented in uh, about 50 clinical sites, at least, uh, that I'm aware of, and uh, is also used in multi-center initiatives, such as Inspired um, Study, led by uh, Claudia Willer-Kingshot, the Can Proco, um, which is a pan-Canadian uh, study of MS patients, as well as the um, as well as uh, it is recommended uh, by the North American Initiative for MS uh, in a recent white paper uh, published um, in 2020. Um, the second aspect that uh, I touched based on uh, was about the analysis tool for spinal cord MRI. And one of the main um, motivation uh, for uh, open source um, is that it promotes reproducibility. Uh, it's fully transparent and it also promotes cross-validation of published studies, which, uh, which is key for, um, for promoting uh, reproducible science in, uh, in neuroimaging. Automated pipelines prevent user bias, uh, such as manual delineation of region of interests, and they also obviously leverage large multicenter studies. So I talked about SCT. Uh, but I also want to mention that there are other um, SCT um, spinal cord specific tools uh, out there, such as spinal fMRI um, or spine reg. And um, you could uh, see uh, a list of the uh, existing tools in the spinalcordmri.org uh, website. So this recent paradigm shift in acquisition and analysis of spinal cord MRI will hopefully pave the way towards a more systematic inclusion of the spinal cord in studies. But there's one remaining aspect which we have not talked about, and this concerns communication. And in particular, um, discussions about unmet needs between physicists, um, clinicians, and MRI vendors is key. In order to promote communication and dissemination of knowledge in the spinal cord community, we have been organizing spinal cord workshops since 2014, every year during the ISMRM time. And these workshops, these workshops are a great opportunity to meet and discuss bleeding edge methods and push the field for, towards for um, better implementation and adoption of some of the QMRI techniques. So if you would like to be on the mailing list or sponsor the event, please visit uh, www.spancordmri.org. And with that, I would like to thank um, everybody in the at the Neuropoly Lab in Montreal. I would also like to thank uh, the numerous collaborators who contributed to um, the studies that I've presented. And um, also, I would like to thank the funding sources. And thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you, Julian. 
Um, I would like to open up the platform to questions. So if anyone has a question, please raise your hand or type it in the question box. We'll wait a couple of minutes. Don't be shy. Okay. Well, if there are no questions, uh, we can end this webinar today. We'll be sending out a questionnaire and it's very short, so it should take less than five minutes and it really helps us plan our next webinar. So your feedback is very important to us. I would like to thank you all for attending and thank you for your talk today, Julian, that was great. And I look forward to seeing many of you on the next webinar. Thanks and have a great day, everyone. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Oh, uh, Julian, are you still there? Uh, I am. Yes, there's one question from Jean-Christophe. Uh, is this appl applicable in small animal monkey studies? Templates might not be ready. So, yes, it, it has been actually applied uh, in uh, marmosets. Um, the, so, the, the, the methods uh, like the segmentation methods or uh, like cord or ms um, like lesion segmentation methods which have been applied in in, in marmo sets um, so some of the techniques could be could be used uh, in terms of templates obviously the the human template is not relevant but um, we have been creating templates for a different species such as rats and mice uh, we are working on a dog template as well um, so it is possible, and uh, if you are interested in uh, new features, you can always reach out to uh, to the team, and we'll be happy to assist. Okay, great. I hope this answers your question, Jean Christophe. Does anyone else have any questions? I'll leave it for one more minute, and if not, we'll we'll close the webinar, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Okay, well, thank you very much, Julian. Thank you everyone for attending. I hope everyone has a great day. Bye thank now. Thank you, you too, bye-bye.